welcome everyone to the Medfield College Film Society. I am Jeff Crawford. It's great to be with you all. And with me, as always, the esteemed society members of the Film Society. I will start with the president and founder, Mr. Robert McSwain. Robert, how are you doing this evening? Hey, I am doing just fine. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, yeah, it's been a long time since I've heard it. I would say that, but it's not true. Because last week I said, you are correct, sir, to my wife. Yes. And she said, that happened <laughs> a lot in my house when I was growing up. And I was like, yeah, Ed McMahon, come on. Whoop, whoop, whoop. whoop. Yes. <laughs> whoop, whoop, whoop. And that's it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you're doing well. Michael Crawford, my brother, down in storm ravaged central Florida. Hope you're staying safe down there. How's it going? Yeah, hunkered down. We've reached code hunker, but all is well. <laughs> Ready to dive into this movie. Ah, 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 ah. Ah. Yeah. Hi. Up in the Highlands, Mr. Andy Brown this evening. How you doing, Andy? Uh, gentlemen, it is mid-November, and it's 70 degrees in the mountains. Uh, climate change is not real. Just want to throw it out there. It's plain unnatural, I'd say. Yeah. That is unacceptable. Yeah. Should yeah, have so snow by now, but yeah. But I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's going to be a great night. We're getting into some new territory. Breaking new ground tonight, boys. Michael, you're right there by Splash Mountain and Typhoon Lagoon. Why don't you tell us what our movie is this week? Our movie is the Touchstone classic, Splash from 1984, directed by Ron Howard, Ronnie H., written by Lau Gans and Babalu Mandel, and Bruce J. Friedman, starring Tom Hanks, Darrell Hannah, Eugene Levy, and John Candy. Uh, this was the first film released by Touchstone Pictures, uh, which was a thing that uh, former Disney CEO Ron Miller had set up as an avenue for the company to release more serious films for an adult audience. A Ron it's Miller joint. All the swear words. Yeah, Ron Miller joint. They load it with the swears up front. This is something that uh, got him a lot of grief from old timers inside and outside the company, which oh. uh, they thought he should stick to family-only content. But Miller had seen what other studios had done in the 70s, and he thought that Disney should do uh, more mature and challenging films and they could do them without sort of crossing a line, go too far. So the company's films were doing worse and worse at the <laughs> box office. He knew something had to change, but sadly, the company had one flop too many, and uh, Ron was ousted before Splash's huge success could rally investors to his side. It did really well. A new CEO came in, Michael Eisner, and uh, he went on to get all the credit for Touchstone's success. And uh, in fact... He was so obsessed with Splash that he allegedly insisted on the name Splash Mountain for the completely unrelated attraction due to his positive connotations of Splash. Uh, the Typhoon Lagoon Water Park was originally supposed to be named Splash. <laughs> and uh, in the original <laughs> plans for Pleasure Island at Walt Disney World, there was supposed to be a bar called Madison's Dive. Mm. So, and that would have been really cool, actually. That would have been something else. So yeah. this was a film that did have a big, big effect. He liked him some Splash, man. Let me tell you. He was big pro Splash. <laughs> what a guy. I was doing some uh, reading about this movie, and I found out Brian Grazer is the one that came up with the idea. Uh, yeah, I noticed that in the credits. Opening yeah, credits. he was driving down the Pacific Coast Highway near Malibu in 1977. And then that 25 year old Brian Grazer was thinking what it would, what it would be like to meet a mermaid and fall in love. As, <laughs> as we all have at some point or another, <laughs> I think yeah. as so. we cruise down the road, uh, in the seventies, yeah. I wonder what he was doing in the seventies to make him think that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, Grazer with the story credit on this one. And so, yeah, this opens up a whole Pandora's box full of movies we could tackle now. I mean, you you name it. You could just do The Rock next week. Nobody would flinch because it's a touchstone, <laughs> you know? The whole so, Bette Midler canon that's right. is at our fingertips. A whole different podcast awaits. So I'm excited to get into touchstone. 
Um, the Shelley Long verse. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Robert, Tom Hanks, he's your guy. Tom is my maybe my favorite actor in Hollywood. And he was uh, much, much more of a, I wouldn't say a nobody, but he was not quite a somebody back when this was made. And he was really, uh, a lot of people passed on this. A lot of studios passed on this. Uh, it had been shopped around town to everybody and kind of wound up at Disney as a last resort. And a lot of people passed on uh, Tom Hanks's role. A lot of people passed on Daryl Hannah's role. So at, somehow they hit upon perfect casting just by eliminating a lot of bigger names at the time. I wonder if there's yeah. anybody associated with the Andy Griffith show in this, uh, in this movie. I saw at least two Howards and a I saw, I caught two Howards. Bass. So actually there were several uh, well, I don't know if there are any Mayberry uh, connections. I'm, I'm kind of trying Maybe to we're Andy stealing Andy's there. thunder here. I'm yeah, thanks a lot. Him. Yeah. <laughs> but I had, uh, there were several Mayberry connections in the opening credits alone. So I was already excited. Yeah. Well, I hadn't I don't think I've ever seen this movie, I have to say. Really? I thought I had seen this movie. I think I've seen parts of it. Of course, it fe- features heavily in a lot of montages. Yes. Um, from the yes. <laughs> the old was, Disney Sunday movie opening montage with yeah. John Candy hitting himself in the head with the racquetball. Uh, the Great Movie Ride, right? Is in that as well, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. You name it. It was there, but I, I don't think I've seen, at least I haven't seen all of this movie. Maybe I've tuned in. This one was in heavy rotation in my home growing up. I watched this really? several dozen times, I bet. That's interesting. That it is seems pretty unexpected. mature. <laughs> yeah, look at it now going, but why was, why? Because I, I was, I mean, I wasn't in, in 84. I didn't watch it when it, in 84. I watched it probably when I was like maybe six or seven. And I think we recorded it maybe because it played on the wonderful world of Disney, correct? And they show it. I would assume they, like ed- ed- assume they did version. because like, it was on the Yeah, montage. it was in the opening credits. I feel like we recorded it off TV and I got the edited version. Because I oh, think I remember well, watching it as a, as a more mature, let me be a teenager, going, God, I don't remember any of the, a lot of these swears. And, uh, and of course, there's a, a scene uh, of Daryl Hannah that certainly wasn't in the made-for-TV version. So. Yeah. yeah. Or edited-for-TV exactly. version. Yeah, and now the of course the Disney Plus version is edited as well, but just yes. digitally. Yeah, it made me laugh that they were worried about showing someone's rear end and didn't care about the swearing, <laughs> and I just <laughs> thought that was ridiculous. Yeah, co- copious swearing and a lot of uh, porn references. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, well, look at a lot of boys. a lot <laughs> of thematic things. Yeah, yes, yes, um, uh, yeah. It's uh they're coming out all with guns a blazing this mature content for their new uh label. But should this have been more of a Hulu release than a Disney Plus release, do we think? I, I think so. I think so. I I think so. Disney after dark, Disney Plus after dark. Um Andy, had you seen Splash before? I had seen pieces of it long time ago i think my sister had rented it on vhs and that was the last time i had seen it so it's probably been since late 80s early 90s well let's hear your non-spoiler reaction to splash i liked a lot of parts of it and pieces of it um the story i think has some strong parts and then it also has some very weak parts i think it kind of comes apart near the end and I also got some serious Little Mermaid vibes as I was watching this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a uh, a fusion there. There's a there's I a. I want to be where the people are. Maybe yeah, I, I, I was, I was kind of thinking is this is like the the what are they doing? They're all doing the remakes now and you know the live action things. And so I was like, maybe this was like a precursor to the live action of the Little Mermaid, even though maybe it we came out. We cut it as a Little Mermaid trailer. Yeah. You got to think it's the uh, Eisner obsession, uh, greenlit Little Mermaid, perhaps? Maybe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let's get into this thing with uh, Andy. You're going to start us off with Act One.
Well, what better way to start a movie called Splash than with the sounds of the ocean? We hear crashing waves and the calls of seagulls as the credits invite us in. Oh, what's that music I hear? Is that a, <laughs> an old sea shanty telling a story of sailors of old drawn into the depths of, by the sirens of the sea? Oh, maybe it's an uplifting melodic overture capturing the beauty of the tides. Nope. It's Wooly Bully by Sam the Sham and the Pharaohs. But not even the original version. It's some no. weird version. Uh, yeah. It reminded me of like future movies to come, which would do this. Yeah. It's a, boomers. <laughs> boomers taking over. Boomers. Very it. boomery. Yeah. My, my notes here, definitely. Music selections, very confusing. <laughs> I thought it was Captain Skeech and the Shrimp Shack Shooters from that right. thing. <laughs> Not the Shrimp Shack Shooters. That's right. <laughs> well, it's, it's 1964 and Cape Cod aboard the New England Queen. And a shindig is happening with a live band and a young white people dancing horribly. Uh, a, young, a young boy sightseeing with his family is on the open deck of the ship and purposefully dropping his change in order to look up ladies' skirts as he picks it up. Already, mm, already. This is like the type of horrible character that only existed in eighties movies. Yes, yeah. yes. It's yes. so like specifically locked into this one period of time that this character would exist. And why <laughs> is that? I don't I, know. But I it was know. really, yeah. I don't know. Just it, kids it, are yeah, I guess it was so too. acceptable back then in the eighties to be able to to be that. It hasn't aged well. <laughs> no. No, it just, when did Meatballs come out? Because that's oh, that's what it felt like to me. Yeah, like eighty three or eighty four. So, yeah, I think there. that kind of set it, set the the pattern. But so, anyways, this this boy, his mother catches her pervert son. His name's Freddie, and he receives a swift smack to the head from his father. Yeah. Meanwhile, his brother Alan is staring to the ocean and becomes mesmerized and decides to just jump in. Um, and <laughs> Why as, not? Yeah, weird vibes, moody. Yeah, yeah, me was, moody. <laughs> oh, I, I, I went to Cape Cod when I was maybe ten or eleven, and that ain't Cape Cod. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Not, not even remotely. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Well, as alarm bells ring and people rush to see what happened, Alan is strangely met in the water by a mysterious young girl who happily greets him. Alan is quickly rescued by a crew member and the young girl breaks the surface of the water and cries as the new England queen sails away. Poetry. Yeah. But as she sails away, we see that this is no ordinary little girl, but rather a young mermaid. Hmm. We fast forward 20 years to the New York city skyline says new year. There was a title that says New York city this morning. And, kind of, we see the majestic twin towers overlooking the Manhattan skyline and that kind of brought a little tear to the eye, but, uh, uh, Alan played by a young and up and coming Tom Hanks, along with his brother now own a wholesale produce business. And Alan is having to deal with an angry customer who's missing his cherries played by the director's father, Rance Howard. Unfortunately, due to some shady dealings by Freddie, who's nowhere to be found. The only cherries Alan has are in terrible shape. Oh man. And this is the first of the great, New York central casting guys, the cherry oh, guys. Yes. 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 Like, hey, hey, my cherries. Hey, hey, hey. Forget about it. What's wrong with my cherries? Hey. Hey. So while trying to deal with this situation, Alan's girlfriend is on the phone and is oh, upset boy. about their relationship. And Freddie, played by John Candy, shows up in a way only John Candy could, <laughs> crashing his sports car into a crate of fruit and lets out a few explicits. And yeah. I love that. That was great. Great, that was a, great music good. playing too. It's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like really there's a lot of that guys, music. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Did you guys pick up on uh, Tom Hanks trying to do an accent in the first couple of scenes and then it just sort of goes away? Yeah. Oh, he pulled a Carrie Fisher, New Hope. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just enough to set the scene. Um, yeah, so Freddie's shown up and he's screaming that he's finally made it into Penthouse Magazine because they've printed his erotic letters. And then he happily begins distributing copies copies of the racy adult magazine. On, Alan eventually satisfies the angry customer and then the two brothers head upstairs to their office. And outside their office, we find out that their poor secretary had recently been hit by lightning and has been <laughs> acting very strange. What? 
let's back up before because there's a great line here I, I love because uh, Rance Howard's like belly aching and he and he tosses him a, a buck. John Kenny goes, "Hey Curly, here's a buck. Go wash my car." And like storms off. <laughs> so, what was your take on on Candy's performance right here out of the gate? I mean, not a just, fan. You didn't like it? No, I just hate <laughs> this kind of character so much. <laughs> I mean, I thought that just the jerk stuff was funny. I enjoyed that, but uh, it's pretty rough. <laughs> pretty rough. It's not aged well, I don't think. Um, no, but it is very classic John Candy. Yeah, he's he's doing his thing there. I'm doing his thing. So yeah, so through the strange interaction with their lightning struck secretary, we find out that uh, that Alan and Freddie's father, who had started the business, and died about five years ago, but. Th- I don't recall that there's any word about their mother throughout the entire film. Did nope, you guys they don't mention her. Uh, yeah, I don't scene, think they mention her. Yeah. Yeah. So in their office, Freddie tells Alan that he met Mr. Byright, who's the owner of Byright Supermarkets uh, at a club. And they are now his new produce supplier, which makes Alan excited, but also concerned because of the pressure that that puts on them. And plus Freddie tells him that he had to make up a story about Alan getting wounded in Vietnam to appeal to Mr. to appeal to Mr. Byright because he was a Green Beret colonel and he's coming by that morning to check on the operation. So yeah, a little bit of stolen valor there to get some to make a buck. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's like John Candy's talent or this writing, but like it, he just takes it over. He takes it over, and it feels pretty jarring. It's like nonstop. It does. It does. <laughs> like, wacky uh not picking up any social cues vibes so alan gets upset because the morning's already been chaotic but chaotic excuse me but freddie reassures him things will be fine then when they are interrupted by another phone call from alan's girlfriend who tells him she's moving out she's moving out of their apartment because alan can't tell her that he loves her and realizing their relationship is over alan is heartbroken uh, and as Michael mentioned, here's a little fun fact. He was mentioning that, you know, some people uh, passed on this role. John Travolta, Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, and Dudley Moore all turned down the chance to play Alan before Man, it went to Some Tom of those Hanks. would have been really terrible. Yeah. Dudley Moore, especially. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine yeah. that. Uh, Steve Gutenberg auditioned for the part, but was turned down the same day as he screen tested for his famous starring role in Police Academy. <laughs> I would have been killer. Yeah, be great. Be great. So anyways, the next day, Freddie attends a wedding of one of their employees, and Alan is a groomsman. And the womanizing Freddie sees some attractive women, and unable to help himself, he decides to go back to the well and use his dropped change bit in order to look up their dresses. Luckily, Alan quickly stops him. And while greeting the wedding guest, Alan pours out his sorrows to his brother about his recent breakup with his girlfriend, Victoria, and how he can't express his love, and there's something wrong with him. And unfortunately, as guests arrive, they keep asking Alan where Victoria is, and he has to make up lies to save face and becomes increasingly more agitated until he finally blows up at the bride's brother, played by Clint Howard, Ron's brother. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love early Tom Hanks acting here. This is just quintessential Tom Hanks. This the screaming, is, the yelling. Yeah. yeah. The shift into high, totally. Yeah. Woody. <laughs> he, he, he maintains it with Woody. Yes. In, in later does. days. Yeah, and Clint Howard had hair. That was everything. That I, I yeah, that, that was creepy, yeah. wasn't it? What a, what a head of hair he used to have. Yeah. I mean, he's so, no offense, but well, I, sorry, Clint, but Clint's not a handsome man, and so he—that's <laughs> probably the best Clint ever looked. <laughs> so, anyways, post wedding, and I wasn't sure if this was part of the reception or it just was after the reception. But Freddie and Alan are in a bar, and Alan's drunk. And after some drunken, awkward encounters with other bar patrons saying how he's going to be alone for the rest of his life, Alan tells Freddie that he's heading up to Cape Cod to get away and feel better. That's some really good Hanks as well, too, with the pretzel so on his from, face. Yeah, good, yeah, good pretzel on the face. Aside from more sleazy candy here, Jeff, did you recognize the guy at the bar who's hitting on the girl that Hanks interrupts? So he looked familiar. I, th- who is he? So I got major, I, I had some sort of snooty eighties TV guy vibe from yes. him, or eighties guy. 
I'm like, it wasn't the guy that like Sigourney Weaver was dating in Ghostbusters. It wasn't him. It was that kind of guy. I found him. He was the uptight husband of one of the Brady daughters. Yes. A very Brady yes. Christmas yes. and subsequent TV show. <laughs> that oh, guy. Oh, yes. Man, that ca- that stereotype was a- another thing. Another 80s stereotype. This yes, movie. very much. This movie is full of like metropolitan guys. guy. Yeah. yeah. Culture. He probably has like nose drops or something. Right. <laughs> And then Freddie, like you said, that, that scene, I mean, he starts growling at those women. Yeah. And they aren't women that he knows. He like literally chases them oh, and is like growling and chasing them. And, uh, they're just random people. Yeah. Like he Freddy. makes fast friends. This is like a sleazy regal beagle they're in. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Instead of driving himself to Cape Cod or letting his brother drive him, Alan takes a taxi 300 miles all the way Jeez. from New York City. And the cabbie drops Alan short of his destination, and Alan tries to find someone to take him over to the island. And that's when he meets the eccentric Dr. Walter Kornbluth, played by the phenomenal Eugene Levy. So does it feel to anyone else like there was a missing scene here? Because they show up and Levy and his like sidekicks are like horsing around on the beach. And then Hank shows up in his tuxedo and he's kind of like moist. And he's like, yeah, they dropped me off on the wrong side. Of the it just felt like there was something like missing there. Mm-hmm. Like he'd been in some sort of antic previously. And I, I didn't, that's a good it. point. I hadn't caught that, but you're right. Yeah. So, yeah, Cornbluth is screaming at his two moronic helpers as they unload some precious scientific cargo from a truck when Alan walks up asking for a lift over to the island. The paranoid Cornbluth refuses, thinking that Alan is there to spy on his research. (laughs) So, Alan, but uh, yeah, but luckily, Alan finally finds someone to take him over. He he finds Fat Jack. Fat Jack. Here we go. Take him over to Cape Cod (laughs) and that boat that Robert, it reminded me of a boat that you and I spent a lot of time on the Sea Donkey. The Sea Donkey, yes. (laughs) You want to tell everybody what the Sea Donkey was? Uh, The Sea Donkey was a boat uh, purchased from Walmart, I believe, (laughs) that was made for, you know, two small people. And Andy and I, and probably 120 pounds of fishing tackle, used to cram into that boat and take it out on the the waters we had no business going out on. (laughs) (laughs) Water coming over the sides. Yeah, it would be swamping. It It was great. Yeah, it's great. I think, and, and you named it the Sea Donkey, as I recall. I did, I did. But uh, so, anyways, yeah. As, as Fat Jack is taking Alan to the island, Alan reveals that he can't swim, and as Fat Jack teases him, the oh. boat motor stalls, leaving them in the middle of the bay. Fat Jack <laughs> says that he can fix it because he's mechanical, and he whacks the engine a few times with a hammer. But when he can't fix it, he just jumps over the side into the water. <laughs> yeah. And begins swimming back to the shore (laughs) to get his other boat. Such a great moment. The the little boat. There are a lot of moments in this movie that feel like they're like from different movies. Like, I feel like Eugene Levy's in a totally different movie than Tom Hanks is in. And then this scene is so random. It's hilarious, but it is super, super random. Yeah. Yeah, It's kind of a a weird setup to this plot, how they they got there. (laughs) yeah (laughs) so yeah that left alan frightened and stranded and all alone but meanwhile cornbluth spots alan bobbing in the water and now he's sure that he's being spot on and (laughs) mr corn beef is this mr corn goons call him (laughs) let me just say cornbluth and his goons unloading all their stuff on the beach gave me i must be in like 80s tv movie vibe but it was real return to mayberry Hunting mm. for the monster. Yes. Uh, yes. Vibes <laughs> there. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Myers Lake. But, monster uh, vibes. A fun fact John Candy actually wanted to play Walter Cornbluth, but uh, Ron Howard convinced him to play Freddy instead after Michael Keaton turned down the role of Freddy. Oh, oh man. Man, that would have been a whole Don't different Tell game. me that. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah, like Cornbluth went to Candy's SCTV co star, Eugene Levy. 
So, all right. So Alan tries to fix the motor himself when it unexpectedly starts up and he's thrown overboard. And while in the water, the boat hits him in the head, knocking him unconscious. And his wallet just falls from his pocket to the ocean floor. But we get a brief glimpse of an arm reaching for him and a golden blonde hair floating just out of frame. Hmm. I like how there are coral reefs off of cake. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> so Alan wakes up on the shore of what we're supposed to think is Cape Cod. But as Michael says, it clearly looks like somewhere tropical with turquoise colored water and a white sand beach. And uh, I, I read that they shot this in somewhere in the, the Bahamas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah they, One they, of the things that I saw said, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, but it is uh, the island that they shot it is now Castaway K for the Disney cruise. Yes. Line. I read oh, that too. Wow. Yeah. That would be so. I, that's totally random, but is definitely the least Cape Cod looking place ever. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So Alan's on the beach and then suddenly what behind some flowers, a beautiful blonde naked woman played by the beautiful Daryl Hannah appears and observes Alan as he begins to stir. Alan coming to his senses, notices her and asks her a series of questions to which she doesn't reply. Instead, she runs towards the water, but suddenly stops and approaches him. And the two recognize some sort of connection. Then she suddenly kisses him and quickly runs into the water. And uh, depending on which version you of you're watching, <laughs> there's a <laughs> pretty bad CG edited behind scene. <laughs> <laughs> that just kind of made me laugh when it happened. Yeah, uh, it's like uh, I, I can't even think of what the equivalent CGI fur from like 1990 seven or something yeah. Yeah, i mean it's on yeah maybe it's like i don't know i kind of thought it like the prequels to star wars but uh, yeah funny. so anyways alan pleads with her to come back and she swims off and as the distraught alan turns his back and walks away we see her jumping out of the water and she's not just a woman but a beautiful mermaid leaping what? into the air free willy style okay. how in the world did they get that effect <laughs> i was watching that just trying to figure that one out yeah, it looked pretty it good. It was a stunt woman. That, from what I read, it was uh, like a stunt woman on like a spring-loaded thing that like kind of launched her. And uh, I have to give my uh, my props to Hans Metz, who was the special effects coordinator in other movies as Tron, Freaky Friday, Gus, and of course the cat from outer space. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Boom. So <laughs> lots of crossover by, by old Hans there. Man, a studio hand. Connecting the dots. <laughs> Once you've taught a donkey to kick a field goal, this was easy. <laughs> yeah. So meanwhile, the beautiful mermaid swims off and picks up Alan's wallet from the seabed when she unexpectedly encounters Dr. Walter Cornbluth scuba diving, and she quickly swims away before he can take a picture of her. Um, oh, another fun fact. Diane Lane turned down the part before it went to Daryl Hannah. Oh, oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So the mermaid swims to a shipwreck where she has a collection of maps, which she uses to look up Alan's address. So I just couldn't help but think I was like, so she can't speak English, but she can read it and she knows how to read a map. And I just yeah. Yeah, thought that was funny. Yeah. It was another in, a, in a little pirate bit of a, ship. Yeah. Yeah. That was a Cape little Cod pirate ship, a little mermaid, uh, callback. Uh, yeah. Number two or whatever. Oh, yeah. And, okay. uh, also very cool shooting i thought i mean that looked really cool i thought i agree i was yeah. uh i can't remember the a J jordan or jordy klein jordan klein is the director <laughs> underwater director of photography and uh and he's a heavyweight i was looking at his his production list i mean he's done just about every movie that's been underwater i mean literally like the abyss everything oh and, wow uh, I, I was i found like his contact information i kicked around the idea of of, of shooting him an email or even calling him his phone numbers online on, on his website. But, uh, he's, he's getting pretty old. Uh, so I don't know if I'm, I was going to bother him or not, but, but yeah, I was, it really, really does look good though. Um, yeah. I, I, Cause I had really so many impressive. questions. Like I was watching this going, boy, is that a set? I mean, what, you know, how in the world did they get this shot? And then, and the other, some of the other shots as well. So mm -hmm. that's what led me down that, that path of, of finding out about Mr. Klein's work. But, so after some time passes and Alan is back at work, 
when he's greeted by his loopy administrative assistant who's wearing her bra on the outside of her clothes. This is just I mean, a, such what a, is, what a is weird that? comedy subplot. I don't, it makes no yeah. sense. <laughs> <laughs> it never like ties in to anything. <laughs> like yeah, like yeah, she doesn't. Yeah, it, it's it's bizarre why they threw that in there. Well, meanwhile, at the Statue of Liberty, the most New York sounding park ranger ever. <laughs> yes, <it's so laughs> That's what I have my notes here. It's like I went to the Statue of Liberty once. I do not recall it being that New York. <laughs> yeah, he's he's giving a speech to some tourists about Lady Liberty when the beautiful mermaid climbs onto the island walking on human legs and still naked, causing quite a stir and causing the ranger to scream, bocce balls. <laughs> also, you hear somebody in the background go, this ain't California. We don't go for this kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> a bunch yeah. of creeps. They're all like, get a picture with her. Yeah, trying to get a picture with her. And then he's like, uh, did you get it all? Oh, my gosh. Yikes. Yikes. But yeah, the bocce balls thing. I, I must have seen this as a kid, but probably on TV, I guess, because I remembered that and thinking like, is that something people say? Is that like an exclamation? Because, uh, yeah, that, that part stuck in my brain. So she's taken into police custody by the cop from Ghostbusters and they find Alan's wallet that she's carrying. So yeah, it's the cop with the Templeton. With, the guy that tells Peck. Templeton Peck, he's a pencil neck. Yeah. It's, don't tell me how to do yeah. my job, pencil neck. Central casting, man. Jeez. Yeah. I did look that guy up, and like, I think he's like, he'll like, you can probably get him to show up at conventions because he he's the cop that was <laughs> on Ghostbusters. <laughs> that's like, that's his claim to fame. Well, there you go. Both, yeah. both movies came out in 84. He was a busy man that year. <laughs> probably wore for, the same uniform. For, for two days of shooting, he was involved in. <laughs> Well, back at the produce business, Alan is meeting with Mr. Byright when he receives a phone call from the police. Alan quickly heads down to the police station as some incredible 80s action music plays in his car. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. Good. So good. <laughs> also, Mr. Byright and his, like, cadre is really Okay, great. Mr. Byright <laughs> and his gang are, like, out of a Medfield movie. <laughs> it really is. Like, they're the mobsters that, like, hassle Dexter Riley or something. Yes. I, like, who were just, they came up in their little, like, uh, little little hats and trench coats and fedoras. Just, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. Something yeah, this, else. this movie is just dripping with, like, stereotype typing New York. I mean, yes. yes. I think that's why, this really at least made an impression on me, I, I think. Well, I mean, this type of stereotype, because this is how I thought New Yorkers were for the longest time. You know, there's so many movies like this, I guess, that just kind of set that stage. I don't know. Yeah, just really me. lean into it. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So anyways, at the at the police station, the desk clerk points Alan to his grateful mystery woman who he rescues. And she walks up and plants another kiss on him as they embrace. The two head back to Alan's apartment and spend some... <clears throat> Passionate time together. Oh, you missed the call out there. The nice symbolism of the elevator. Uh, ex explain that to me, Rob. Hop in the elevator, and the and you know the numbers start going up, and then it. So. What do you mean? Well, they just went up to the up to the fifth floor. That's all. Gotcha. I'm okay. So the next. Can morning I just say that in the midst of this, Daryl Hannah's hair is a force of nature. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> How much work did that require? I mean. <laughs> appreciate the game you know it's, yep. it's something else so the next I, I, i'm it's not really clear what the timeline is i wasn't sure if it was the next morning or <laughs> right. later that afternoon i think it was later that afternoon i, okay. I agree because yeah all right so anyways alan is singing zippity doodah while making a <sighs> breakfast slash meal slash snack <laughs> And, uh, Can we talk about this meal? Yeah, it's, it's like all for her, and it's like it's huge. I don't know, like fifty pieces of bacon and twenty pancakes or something. It's yeah, ridiculous. and like fruity pebbles or something like that. Yeah. I can't remember exactly what it's he like had. The Pee Wee drinks. breakfast times five from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Alan struggles to tear himself away from his newfound love in order to go back to work, but eventually gives into his desire and returns to her arms. 
And then you're, you're going to put me in the hospital is what he <laughs> says. <Yeah. laughs> and she's not speaking. She's still not talking. No. Right. Must be awfully That's... lonely as a mermaid. <laughs> Apparently. Kind of makes you uh, wonder about Alan, though. I mean, yeah, he's getting kissed I mean, by this girl, but she's not answering. So, I mean, I don't know. He uh, seems unconcerned. Yeah. yeah. zippity doo da. Finally, Alan makes it back to work, still singing zippity doo da, and begins dancing with Freddy, to which he replies, Not in front of the Teamsters. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Love that line. That was a good I had line. that line. Great, that good line. great union <laughs> joke. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, You're a terrible lead or something like that. That was nice. But while Alan is gone, the mystery maid is, or excuse me, the mystery man. While Alan is gone, the mystery mermaid is watching television in his apartment and sees Bloomingdale's commercial and decides to go there dressed in one of Alan's suits. I'm assuming that that commercial was real, in which case, totally bizarre commercial. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, I I just, I haven't been swimming in the Hudson River lately, but kind of think maybe she needs to go see a doctor at least at the you know, early stages of this movie oh man i kept <laughs> thinking about like when they were diving in and out of the east river or whatever and yeah, they go to the east river about, later oh on, yeah. man in the 80s yikes <laughs> so, well the building's doorman hails her a cab and she is in wonder as she walks through the store until she arrives at the women's department she, she seems to have the- discovered the concept of cash rather fast i don't yeah, so, I mean, maybe there's a monetary system in the ocean we're not aware of, but Clam. yeah, she's throwing that credit card around off an awful lot. Well, she is met by an old saleswoman who helps her find some new clothes and has a line something oh, like, uh, "I couldn't get my leg in there, but my daughter is anorexic or something like yeah. that." I'm so yep. jealous of my daughter; she's anorexic. Ah, <laughs> oh, boy. But yeah, she makes the Andy Hall reference with the uh, with the suit. And, yeah, which was hot. hilarious because like the suit looks like way better than any of the clothes in the store. Like she's rocking that suit. Yeah, she's like, oh, that's Andy Hall look is so outdated, and uh, it's like, no, uh, actually, that's awesome, and your clothes are terrible. So. <laughs> well, as she's leaving the store, she discovers the televisions in the in the electronic department and becomes fascinated by what she's seeing. Meanwhile, Alan returns home to an empty apartment and runs out to Timmy, the doorman, to find out if he knows where she is. Alan arrives at Bloomingdale's and finds his new lady love still watching the television and has been there for six hours. How big is Blooming? How big is Bloomingdale's? I mean, he probably pretty big. Yeah, he stumbled onto her pretty, you know, pretty. He's got it, man. He's yeah. like, ah, oh, she's probably the electronics uh, yeah. department. Where else would she like go? An electronics girl. I will say that when she's uh, watching all the TVs, one of them has the black hole on it. Oh, nice. oh I've seen from the black I hole. I saw that. And then uh, there was Crazy Eddie, which, you know, is, is a thing. Is, is a thing. Uh, and I was obsessed with all the electronics behind the counter when they were, like, talking to her. I was like, oh, yes. man, some cool. This old... Betamax VCRs. That one, <laughs> yeah. like, turntable that was, like, on its side. Oh, gosh, I know. And the that receivers. So much cool stuff. So Alan tries to explain to one of the salesmen that she doesn't speak any English when suddenly she begins speaking it perfectly clearly, albeit in the style of television commercials and the game shows. But uh, and Alan asks her, asks his new newly fluent special lady friend what her name is, and she says she can't say in English but pronounces it in her high-pitched dolphin-like native tongue, causing the televisions to burst much to the surprise of Alan and the other salesman. As the two walk back to Alan's apartment, his attractive companion is astonished by the sights and sounds of the city, much to Alan's own amazement. She tells Alan that she's only going to be in town for six days until, I think she said, until the moon is full. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And if she stays longer, that that she will never be able to go back. And Alan thinks that she's talking about some sort of immigration problem. (laughs) So, while walking, <laughs> while walking, why would that involve the full man? That's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so ridiculous. So, while yeah. walking the streets and trying to figure out what to call her, they approach Madison Avenue, and she decides that she likes the name Madison. Boom! And, and tells Alan that he's the reason she came there and wants to stay with him. Um, another fun Doesn't fact: Doesn't he find any of this really weird? Like to the point where maybe he needs to pump the brakes a little bit. He's just like. Huh. Okay. 
<laughs> He's all in. I mean, he tries to get her to stay at a hotel. I guess the that's true. That's true. Yeah, but he does it under the guise of like, I thought you could stay at a hotel, but would you like to stay with me? <laughs> yeah, I'd rather you stay with me, kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, she could kill him. <laughs> she could be some Norwegian model serial killer, right? Assassin. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, fun fact: the this movie popularized the name Madison. In the United States, Madison went from the 216th most popular name for girls in 1990 to 29th by 1995 and to third by the year 2000. That's well, crazy. Yeah, I saw something with Daryl Hannah where she's saying, like, people don't understand now that it, like, it was a joke in the movie. That, like, oh, that's a street name. That's not a person name. That's, that's a funny thing to call a person. <laughs> but, like, now everybody's like, yeah, so that's, that's the name. Mm-hmm. And it's not a joke anymore. So later that night, while Alan's asleep, Madison feels the need to take a bath. But not just any bath. She fills the tub and adds salt. And as she's about to slip in, her legs transmorph from human legs to a scaly lower torso of a mermaid's tail. That was a little uncomfortable, the scale effect to me. I thought it was pretty cool. I thought it was cool, too. Yeah, I I thought it was cool. Yeah, Morphin. Yeah, it makes yeah. me it makes me think how they did it. It looks like they had some material there, and then they had like a vacuum that just kind of yeah, sucked. Just, right, yeah. right. That's what that's what it was. Yeah, okay. it's pretty and, cool. And I read that the, the tail weighed like thirty five pounds and took wow. three hours to put on. So, yeah. So anyway, Alan wakes up realizing that she's not in bed, and knocks on the bathroom door. A startled Madison tries to quickly draw off in order to hide her true form. And when Madison does not immediately open the door, Alan tries to knock it down, thinking she's in some sort of trouble. And after he breaks in, yeah, Yeah. after he breaks in, she says that she was just being shy, much to Alan's bemusement. The following day, back on Cornbluth's research vessel, Cornbluth notices that one of his goofball helpers is looking at a tabloid with an article on the front page about a naked woman at the Statue of Liberty. (laughs) He recognizes the woman as the mermaid. They got on the boat. <laughs> yeah, he recognizes the woman as the mermaid he had previously seen, and he uh, demands to be taken back to shore. And can gentlemen- we just talk about these guys, though? Sorry, to go for it, freak in. But I mean, just these guys. His assistants yeah. are uh, something else. Well, there's a line they give earlier with a really sort of bad Boston accent. Where they go, "What you looking for down that buried treasure?" <laughs> so I mean it's just they're like the whole, Cape Cod hillbillies. Yeah, they want to don't they want to pee down the air hose or something at one point too? Yeah. Don't they mention that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's pee down the air hose. <laughs> yeah, they are they're these guys are I don't even know how to describe them, but they are something else. So yeah, gentlemen, I think that uh, wraps up Act One. Two opens with Madison watching daytime TV in 1984, mind you, and she is boohooing heavily. Alan comes home to inform her that it's Bonanza, which, out of all the shows to be crying over, that's that's pretty good humor. I thought. <laughs> you'd think she would have, uh, you th- probably, you think she'd been exposed to uh, violence on television at Bloomingdale's, but you know, I guess not. It's a different Al- time of the day, you know. Maybe it was true. Yeah, she's watching Richard comedies. Simmons, wasn't she? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. That's pretty That's violent. Pretty That's violent. <laughs> yeah, it gets my sensibilities. <laughs> Alan explains to her that it's acting, and he then hands her a blue box and tells her he got her a gift. Madison, being a mermaid, thinks the box is the gift. Hank plays off the naivete beautifully as Alan informs her to open it. Inside is a music box with two dancing Victorian figures. With some nice little foreboding as the as Ron Al, uh, Ron Allen as uh, foreboding as Ron Howard pushes in on the feet of the figures, and uh, another Little Mermaid 
foreboding. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. See? Yeah. See? See? Yep. <laughs> Alan takes Madison out on the town as he continues to fall deeply in love with her. They come to a, this, they come to a statue of a mermaid on the water's edge. Madison asks if he likes this sort of thing, and he tells her he's always had a, an attraction to mermaids. And Madison, uh, ever since the incident, he's always had an attraction to mermaids. Ever since the incident, Madison reveals that she remembers and quickly deflects as she realizes her mistake. Alan complains that they're sold the park to build some riverfront condos or some sort of nonsense because building condos in New York is stupid. But can we talk about this fountain, though? Yes. This fountain is an important fountain. Yes, we need to talk about the fountain. This fountain, a fixture, a Latter-day fixture of the Disney MGM Studios theme park back lot. Yes. Oh, where you could visit In a very fountain. inauspicious place. It was yes, like... in probably the worst possible place it <laughs> right. could be located for its, yes. beside the like the random food stand and the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids playground. Right. Uh, yeah, the Splash Fountain just sat up there. I, I wonder what has happened to it. It was and, there till the bitter end. I mean, I feel like the last time I went, it was still there. So, yeah. who knows? Another little... Uh, Some executive tr- has it in their backyard now. Yeah, probably so. Another little bit of trivia. Uh, the mermaid on top of this mermaid fountain was <laughs> made from the same mold as an ice mermaid that appears in a banquet scene in Herbie Goes Bananas. Oh, oh. yes. Yes. Interesting. So, yeah, there you go. <laughs> little uh, the a connection that I never really expected. Yeah, let's use that mermaid mold again. Yeah. <laughs> hey, whatever happened to that mermaid mold from Splash? <laughs> At the uh, racquetball club, Freddie invites Alan to a presidential dinner. Alan asks if he could take Madison instead of going with his annoying brother, Freddie. Freddie begins to kneel his brother for being in love and then proceeds to perform various professional wrestling moves on him. Yeah. <laughs> and Weird beaver mascot in that this locker room. <laughs> yes. Too. I just said, oh, that was that weird, out. too. <laughs> <laughs> that was so strange. Also, like uh, John Candy with a cigarette in his mouth. As they play racquetball. Yeah, and it's like oh, cooler man. beers in the like fancy racquetball room. <laughs> and the people watching, too. That yeah, was really I wondered, strange. I was, this whole movie has such like 80s New York all over it. And I just wondered, what were those people doing? <laughs> I don't <laughs> just, like know. hanging out. Let's go watch these guys play racquetball. So in what I call the most 80s scene in the whole movie, we find a very fit, spry Tom Hanks playing racquetball with his out of shape overweight co-star John Candy, who's smoking a <laughs> cigarette, as we've just pointed out, whilst doing so. After five minutes, Freddie takes a beer break because you got beer in the racquetball court. And they begin to discuss Madison as people, as you also pointed out, are on looking. Very weird. but So they begin to discuss Madison and they try to figure out where Madison came from and why she is so mysterious. Freddie figures she fell overboard off of a cruise ship and swam for a long, long time over uh, through uh, naked through minefields because I guess the coast of New York was heavily fortified during the Cold War. Uh, I don't recall there being a lot of minefields in that part of our country, but, you know, what do I know in 84? Alan can't figure it out and is just overthinking it. After a lengthy discussion to... Paraphrase, Freddie tells him to just have a good time. Then he serves uh, and hits himself in the head. That's the shot right there. Mm-hmm. How many times did they have to do that to get that just right? Or do you think they just it was by mistake and they thought it was funny? No, it seems like he leans into it. So, According uh, to the internets, which again, never wrong. Uh, take with a keeping grain of salt, that was one take. Wow. And also, Candy was actually drunk. That, that I believe. That I, I, I believe that. Yeah. The the, the one take is is the most amazing part of that story. <laughs> yeah. And to rewind a little bit, I mean, yeah, Tom Hanks is like beanpole super fit. Tom Hanks, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, I kept like being shocked during this movie, like how super skinny he was. Yeah, like real thin. Tom Hanks, it's like even skinnier than big. Tom Hanks. 
Yeah, well, speaking of big, it, it, I'm sorry. The movie Big. It reminded me of that scene in Big because he played. Doesn't he play racquetball in Big? He plays well? like uh, uh, like yeah. squash or something out there on that court. Or, yeah. outside. Yeah, it's a '80s New York requirement. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, Corn Bluth is back on land and is presenting his findings to a group of scientists. I presume. <laughs> It's just people in a, at a, in a board table. Dr. Ross is not amused and humiliates poor Walter in front of his peers, almost making us feel sympathetic for old Corn Bluth, maybe. Back at Alan's sizable apartment, Madison has gotten him a gift and she can't wait to show him. She brought him a giant water fountain, the same one from the park. What are your but thoughts on this? How? How? Because like the guys are like leaving when he shows up with like a, just like a hand dolly or whatever. (laughs) And then this thing is stone. It's enormous. It would take a a crane. (laughs) Yeah. It take a crane and to knock out a wall (laughs) and like probably it would fall through the floor too. So (laughs) it's got running water. I mean, it's full. I mean, it's (laughs) yeah, that's right. right. And got an electrical hookup too. So yeah, I don't know how they got it through the door, but that's, I just, my assumption is that the, the, the tenant association, his apartment building must be really lax. They must be really laid back there. (laughs) I mean, yeah, I start to wonder even more about like their, you know, cause he's just like, huh, that's weird. Oh, well, but it's like, wouldn't you think it's really weird at this point? Like, she's, <laughs> maybe she's not all there kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Especially since she bought it with like his credit card or whatever. And she's like, it's because I love you. <laughs> well, she, she sold it in her, her, her necklace. Straight in her oh, necklace. Oh, that's right. Yeah. It, yeah. My bad. Pearls, I kept yeah. thinking it was going to be his credit card, but it was her necklace. My bad. That was Bloomingdale's on his credit card, I think. Yeah. That's right. So yeah, we have yeah. a tender moment there, and, and Madison says that she confesses that she loves Alan, and that's why she sold her necklace. And Alan has finally found the love he has been looking for, albeit she doesn't know what a box is, a gift box is, and she's buying fountains, and there's a lot of red flags going up here, but you know, whatever. Alan Bauer. <laughs> <laughs> she also has superpowers to shatter glass with yeah, her voice. Yeah. She didn't speak yeah. <laughs> for their first uh, intimate encounter, and afterwards, a lot of red flags. He named her. Yep. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's always not, not that's a red flag. A little, a little, a little alarming when when you have to name <laughs> name your date. <laughs> yeah. Never What's your name? That. What do you want it to be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, Madison sounds pretty good. <laughs> she must be an immigrant. That's just normal. Yeah, <laughs> clearly there's an immigration issue at play. Name all the time. Ay, ay, ay. Doctor Ziddell, who was Corn Bluth's teacher, is lecturing him about making such a ridiculous claim to the colleagues. We find out that Corn Bluth is some sort of uh, savant who was studying marine biology at the age of twelve under Doctor Ziddell. Andy, yes, sir. Proceed. I I missed this one. It is Ernest T. Bass himself. <gasps> no wow. way! I didn't even notice uh, Ernest T. Bass himself as the professor. I was so happy. Walter, now humiliated and driven, is on a quest to save his reputation. Armed with a camera and two buckets of water, he runs down the streets of New York City chasing after someone who loosely resembles Madison. Hey, how did he know where Madison was, though? I mean, was it like the, I'm assuming the police report? I I guess uh, that could be. Maybe he went to the, so he knew that she was at the Statue of Liberty. He went to the police and then found that she left with some guy named Alan. That's the only way I can think. That, that, that's plausible. Okay. And again, this feels like it's like from another movie. I'm trying to think of even what movie it feels like, but uh, it's almost like um, Fish Called Wanda mm. when mm-hmm. uh, Michael Palin keeps getting keeps trying to kill the yes, old woman. Totally, and, uh, 
<laughs> keeps killing her dogs by mistake and injuring himself. <laughs> that's, so that's what it feels like. Okay, I solved it. So in what was one of the more bizarre choices from Ron Howard, <laughs> yes. we get a first-person encounter of the incident as Eugene Levy douses some poor bystander with water. And we're looking through Dr. Kornbluth's camera. The annoyed husband then proceeds to approach Walter, but as his green screen hand covers up the lens, we hear yeah. sounds of someone getting beaten up. That's really strange. <laughs> the Compton hand is so weird. Yes. It's not enough. Needs a needs something else. Uh, also, the husband was a dead ringer for Butch Davis. The football coach. <laughs> <laughs> he was. It's yeah. so, oh, man. I didn't, yeah. yeah, you're right. <laughs> uh, uh, never forget Butch. At dinner, Hanks is doing his best Tom Hanks and fidgeting and flipping things with his fork and flips the fork at somebody's head. It's kind of funny, but it's pretty Tom Hanks. Yes, yeah, that was a weird bit of business. Yeah. Fun. So then he tries to propose to Madison, who quickly redirects as this enormous lobster arrives and she proceeds to eat the entire thing, shell and all, because why not? Mermaids like yeah. lobster, man. She really so, digs into man. that, man. Yeah. The date continues at the skating rink. Alan again tries to propose as they both do awkward skating moves. They sit down and Alan proposes directly and Madison rejects it. Alan gets understandably upset and ignores Madison as he sees other couples skating happily. Alan begins to lose his temper with Madison and she gets upset and skates off and runs home. And Alan tries to chase after her with his skates on. And then in what is another great New York city moment, the yes. attendee tackles him yes. telling him to show some dignity for Christ's sake. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of the high points. <laughs> so I, I enjoyed that that one. I thought that was pretty good. And, and thought, in New York, I thought Alan was being ridiculous, though. I mean, yeah, he, he takes a quick turn. Yeah, yeah, he's the one that's built this up, really. Yeah, yeah. it's like I just met you. Will you marry me? Also, I know nothing about you, <laughs> and now I'm mad. Yeah, and sarcastic. A symbolic storm rolls up immediately. Yeah. Alan. Alan wanders the streets of New York looking for Madison, and I guess being under a bridge kept Madison dry, and she hunkers down during the storm. And under the Brooklyn Bridge, Madison looks at the East River and contemplates going home. That's a deep, deep shot right there. Yeah, it is. Yes. The next morning, Madison comes back and tells Alan yes and chooses to stay with him. As they leave to begin planning their marriage, Cornbluth, now a janitor, I guess, at the building, or he's <sighs> pretending to be one, is hoping to catch Madison. Hang on a second. Look, his, coming back, I was like, did sure. we, don't they talk about blood tests? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's talking about how quick they can get a blood test to get married. Yeah. And it's, I mean, they don't, is that something that you have to do in certain think, states? Back then, and certainly, I think definitely, I think the, even now there are certain certain states you have to. Yeah, uh, shout the out. The big blood thing tests. was like Maryland. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, like Maryland was like the only place because he mentions Maryland. Like Maryland was the place where you would go because it was the only place that didn't require a blood test. Is it to find out to see if you're related or something like that? Yeah, something to do with that. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Interesting. And like a uh, certain like. Um, well, it may not have had to do with genetic factors, but yeah, some something to do with that. Yeah, but okay. Maryland didn't require it, so people would go to Maryland if they wanted to get married real quick. It's the Tijuana right. of the East Coast. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> uh, sorry, Robbie. Go ahead. With Corn Blue's arm and one of those raised casts, he smashes the glass on the building fire hose and waits at the elevator, only to find the same couple he doused with water previously. Poor corn blue. What luck. Corn blue. Starting to feel sorry for this poor guy. Madison continues to try and confess her secret to Alan, but he's too excited talking about blood tests and running off to Maryland. And they proceed to the dinner with the president. Yes. 
Alan needs to work on his listening skills. Well, mm. yeah. And the it, observation skills. I mean, there's a lot an, of... He's an yeah. eager young man. <laughs> he is. And I mean, I understand. But yeah. at the same time, come on. <sighs> at the restaurant, Walter shows up with his glasses broke, his neck in a brace now. The maitre d' looking at a broken man asks, Why are you here? Cornbluth quickly and hysterically responds, Union sent me. Yeah. They argue with that. Bam. That's... <laughs> Another great union joke. We see that Walter has built a backpack that will spray water. He <laughs> proceeds to approach Madison as the Secret Service quickly notice. And well, Andy, I'll give you a break here. Who was the Secret Service agent? I don't know. Do you recognize that? this one? No. Patrick Cronin. But we will remember him as Sid Farkas, the best huh. in the bra business from Seinfeld. Oh, nice. Madison decides that she has to tell him the secret right now, and they decide to leave. Removed and humiliated, Walter, who had tried to spray Madison in the restaurant uh, after the Secret Service uh, dragged him out, is outside fighting with the Secret Service, reaches for his spray gun, and hoses Madison down as they are getting into their car. Everyone is in shock, and we hear Cornbluth shout, Behold! The mermaid! <laughs> this scene was disturbing. Yeah, it, yeah, was, it really was. Really it was weird. bizarre and just I mean, disturbing. it was like this, like, in the line of fire, like, pacing of, like, <laughs> he's kind of A lot of slow-mo. A lot of slow-mo, like, hosing down. It's very disturbing. Yeah, yeah. She, she calls out for Alan, and he just ignores her, and it's just... I don't know. Yes. Shocked. Shocked. And she's like sitting there like sobbing. It's awful. Yeah, it's terrible. It's terrible. Also, why the whole president subplot? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, why did we have the banquet with the president? I mean. <laughs> and get Ronald Reagan in there, for goodness sake. That would have been yeah. great. You wouldn't do well, anything else. <laughs> roll him out. I'm just a California actor. Well. Well. well mommy. Nancy. Is the one with the mermaid? Chaos ensues, and for some reason, the Secret Service pick up Madison and throw her in a car. As she's, as <laughs> it's we awesome. mentioned, is she's screaming for Alan, who's not doing anything. He just like ghosts her. Yeah. yeah. And then the Secret Service grab Alan, and the second act comes to an end. I guess they're just like unlimited constitutional powers when you have a mermaid. It's Cold War, <laughs> man. Like, you know, anything you could use yeah. in the Cold War is, could be an advantage. There's just a lot of rule bending back then. Send her to Gitmo. That's right. <laughs> we open in a military lab where Alan is being monitored in a water tank. I enjoy the camera work here. I thought this was really, really good on, on Ron's part. Because it, it, it's the tight shot, and then they slowly pull out and, and re reveal. Yeah. He's in the buff. Yeah, he's in That's the right. buff, being very modest. I always pulling out this military lab is in, like, the basement of the Museum of Natural yes. Science. <laughs> yes. Which I yeah. don't understand how that works. Well, Theodore Roosevelt, you know. He's, oh, it has got to be, right? I was asking about what, what, what government agencies ever seen this. I mean, it, they just... Tossed him in a tank of water, but it's got to be an X yeah. Files about this, the right? You know? yeah. Oh yeah, true. <laughs> so they're trying to make sure he's not a fish, and he keeps yelling, "He's not a fish!" So they bring in Madison on a gurney, uh, naked, of course. Drop her in the pool with Ellen. I mean, this is come on, not great. Come on, guys. Alan is not feeling it. He splashes Madison away. It's shocking. You know, I thought she was a totally normal girl. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> there were no indications that there was anything unusual about this. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would be, I think I would be kind of, I'd be like, you're a mermaid. That's interesting. 
It all makes sense I, I, now. I, I got it. <laughs> yeah. I'd say, Madison, tell me your name again underwater and bust this glass and get out of here. Oh. Genius. That See? is a great idea. Genius. Instead, he is pouting, uh, and the scientists get him out, blindfold him, and take him home. Not a good Toss look. Toss him out Hanks. of a van. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, the uh, the press is hiding in the lobby of his apartment. They rush out and ask a lot of questions about whether or not he had sex with her and how. I mean, would that be what they really ask? Maybe in 84. <laughs> I don't the 80s. Know. It could be. It could be. It's I'm movie. from People Magazine. Right. Is she dating Burt Reynolds? <laughs> <laughs> Which, just what? Oh, Burt yeah, Reynolds yeah. joke. In comes Freddy to the rescue. Spirits Alan away. Not before asking, is anyone here from Penthouse Magazine? <laughs> then we ain't talking. <laughs> Gotta get that oh, call back in. That, that was the great. earlier gag. Full circle, oh, man. I loved that part. Back at the docks, the employees are in awe. To which Freddy says, what's the matter? You haven't seen anyone sleep with a fish before? They're really, <laughs> really keyed in on this one aspect of the uh, thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Freddy leans into Alan for being upset about Madison. He's happier with her than most people will ever be. To which, I, you know, I agree with Freddy. The one time yeah, in the movie. Yeah. You know? This was Freddy's, like, redeeming turn uh, right. for me. It's like, Freddy, you are, you are, you are correct, sir. I got, there's a scene where they're showing the headline. I feel like they missed a really good comedy gag there. I mean, it's just a pretty straightforward headline. It says something like mermaid and, and found in New York fish man or something like that. It just, yeah. Oh yeah. The tab, the New York papers would have done something way better than that. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. They would have had something far more clever than that. Alas, back at the lab, Madison ain't looking too good. Walter starts to have second thoughts about holding Madison as she is not holding up to the tests well. Oh, she's got the ick. Yeah, she's starting to scale up and get a little pale. But Flush after her down the she, toilet. That's right. <laughs> after the lead scientist suggested an internal exam, i.e. a dissection, I guess, he blesses out Walter and tells him to go find a unicorn. So Walter's having second thoughts. Madison isn't holding up too good. It's clear that Alan is all over the place. Where to next? The dentist. <laughs> yeah. This was not where I expected it to go at all. Me neither. <laughs> and again, <laughs> suddenly it's like, it's like Steve Martin's dentist from uh, little shop. Yes. 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 I said the a sadistic German dentist is a little on the nose here. I think, but, yeah. It just seemed like, you know, Walter is a busy man. I know he's been injured, but does he really need to go to the dentist right now? I Maybe guess he had so. a cracked tooth or something. You never know. Because he yeah. has like this moment of guilt and moment of like realization. And then it's like, oh, he's going to do something. And no, he goes <laughs> to the dentist to get his tooth fixed. Yeah, he's it's getting so some, weird. Some serious surgery here. And Alan shows up to the dentist office. Wanting how? to talk. So, again, this is like Bloomingdale's times 50. You know, like, how does he know in a world? I don't know. Maybe it was different. You know, maybe Walter had a secretary that we don't know about. It's a answering much smaller service. town back then. <laughs> <You Maybe. laughs> Walt everybody knew everybody and, in New York. That's yeah. Right. So they get into it. They're, they're, you know, getting into it physically around the all the equipment and walter accidentally stabs himself with the needle of the numbing agent ah, he's having a bad day having a bad week yeah. yep but, uh, but again we thought he was going in the direction of helping but then he resists but then he helps anyway but then he helps anyway yeah as immediately we see freddie allen and walter heading off to the museum of well, natural history but i will say that the the numbed legged physical comedy routine yeah. Levy did was really that was pretty funny. I laughed as he's trying to walk away and he's dragging his foot behind him. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's doing it. So they're they're heading off to the museum uh, where the secret lab is. Um, there's some really pretty cool shots of the museum. Make me want to go, but um, the American yeah, that's, Museum of Natural History. Come for the history and stay for the inhuman treatment of mermaids. That's yeah. right. The stay secret. for the vivisection of sentient <laughs> <Yes>. beings. <laughs> so, 
the lab is expecting some Swedish scientists and the <laughs> brothers Freddie and Alan act like they are the Swedish scientists, but they draw some skepticism from the guard who happens to be half Swedish. And luckily, Freddy knows a little Swedish from a nudie film he got because the best nudie <laughs> films come from Sweden. Of course. Yeah, they do. Mm. It's just a well-known fact. Then they get stopped by another guard who thinks Freddy looks a little dark, to which they said he's just dirty from the trip. <laughs> just, <laughs> what? Yikes. Also, this guard is... I know. Like, I thought for a second it was Otis from Mayberry. I, I did, too. I did, too. <laughs> Yeah, uh, because he is just pure yokel. Buck Walter. Uh, he is like the archetype from, yeah, from a little bit earlier time period. It seems it like the like, 60s Gomer Pyle, but worse. But yeah, yeah, Cletus, the slack jawed yokel. Why does he have a helmet on, too? I mean, what, <laughs> is he, in case he catches some flack in there in the hallway. I, I mean, what's no, I don't know. There's Yeah, there's some choices here that are confusing not not, the least of which is the fact that this buck walter guy is an idiot guarding a (laughs) national yeah the last uh the last bastion of security but (laughs) they get through it through pretty easily and they make their way into the lab madison is very excited to see alan there's some more making out we go outside to where the guard is on watch and they uh, bring Madison out, covered up, claiming it's Freddy who was attacked by Madison, they say. With lasers from her eyes. Yeah. Scar is not the sharpest tool in the shed. Well, yeah. I, not to mention the other three that had to go by. I mean, it just... Right. Well, then, yeah, yeah, they never show them going by them. <laughs> they never, I mean, they never yeah. try and pull the that off. The escape was just so half-baked to me. I, this is where I, I was starting to really get tired. Also, the fact that Candy magically lost like a hundred or right fifty pounds or whatever to become Madison in the wrap. And thing. why would he need to be completely wrapped up? There's so many. It just seems like a quick uh, solution to a problem. But they uh, they quickly leave the museum, speed off. So the Museum of Natural History must be guarded by the 34th Infantry Division. I mean, it would- yeah. What's going on here? They've got like a whole platoon of <laughs> it's a platoon like, of <laughs> soldiers and coast guard helicopters and everything. They discover this when the Swedish doctors arrive in real life, only to find Freddy is smoking on top of the fish tank with a fishing pole. <laughs> which I thought it was, was like interesting. It was, yeah, they made it from a like a reel to reel, you know, yes, cassette or something. I don't. So, yeah, as the guys say that the military is on the case and it's, uh, yeah, I guess it it must be a Cold War thing again. You know, you've got the, you got a mermaid, you got to take advantage of this technology. Who knows if you could, you know, invade the, the North Sea with a mermaid soldier. It's like on King of the Hill when they tried to make Bill Dotry into a walrus man. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, they're, they're there, they're, they're laying in wait and there's, uh, army trucks, soldiers, helicopters. Hut, 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 hut. Yes, a lot of that. Yes. Oh, big, big <laughs> hut hut vibe. And there's a, uh, sure. you've got the elderly men playing chess in the park. They all go by and they're concentrating on the chess game. He goes up to their, they're chasing at Central Park and then they're down at Wall Street the next minute. They're going all over the place. Walter asks to get out of the car saying, I'll stop this now. I'll finish it. And uh, Madison gives him a kiss. He attempts to stop the army trucks by standing in the road, and they drive him off the road, to which he says, what a week I'm having. (laughs) (laughs) Then the uh, army truck gets stopped by a taxi parked in the road. and uh, It's the same taxi driver that drove him to the uh, Cape Cod. He's wearing an incredible coat. He says, up yours, Goma, I'm waiting for a fare. (laughs) It's the (laughs) soldier's. Pick up his car and roll it over in a lot of hut, 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 there. <laughs> that was a great moment. So Alan drives Madison down to the dock. She says she has to get back in the ocean. The world would never leave her alone. Madison says there's a way for Alan to come with her. And she finally, finally reveals that she was the mermaid he came across when he was a boy. She invites him into the sea. Tells him he can never return. Why not? 
Yeah, all those, yeah she can come up, but he can't get it. Yeah, why not? Yeah, Lots of rules. Alan won't take that bait. Says his goodbyes. Can't leave Freddy. Madison dramatically jumps off the dock into the East River. Some great... Ugh. St- Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. The most heavily trafficked, overly contaminated waterway on the Eastern Seaboard. That's right. And as soldiers and helicopters swarm, Alan finally jumps into the ocean. He changes his mind. A team of divers jumps in after him. Yeah, he didn't just jump in, though. I mean, he forced Gump jumps in. Yeah, like, he did. I think that makes me think if Tom Hanks actually just jumps that way. <laughs> it's not acting. He just <laughs> instinctively leaps. Comes natural. Yeah. Madison arrives first and gives him a kiss. More making out as the divers arrive in hot pursuit. Madison Big kicks thunderball vibes here. Yes. Madison kicks one in the groin with her tail proceeds to pull off masks, little wacky hijinks. Alan bites a leg. <laughs> Madison grabs Alan, swims away with well, the coral reefs of the, uh, yes, the East river the East coral river. reefs. <laughs> uh, we see the coral reefs to a great song. Very of the time. One fine day. Love came for me. Feels like kind of like a song from the Pete, from Pete's dragon or something. And, uh, <laughs> The credits roll as they uh, swim off over the coral reef right outside New York City. And uh, a little later, we see them swimming into the Mermaid City Palace Village. I don't know. We (laughs) are so glad to see you. (laughs) (laughs) You got to swim to the core. You think your, your brains are so big. That's how it ends, boys. The end. One fine day, love came for me, and love was rare as love can be. Thin. <laughs> Splash. Get it. Ah, oh, nice, Michael. I just, yeah. That's nice. Yeah, Thin. Very thin. nice. Man, so, yeah. I think, <laughs> I think we should just go into rating this thing. Yeah, I'll just cut to the chase here. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Oh, so we uh, have our advanced rubric here. Robert, what, what's our scale tonight? Scale. Oh, I think, I think you just found it there, Jeff. <laughs> you don't want to do union workers? Uh, although union Teamsters. workers. Teamsters. Penthouse magazine. Teamsters. <laughs> yeah. A lot of good ideas. A lot of good ideas. Uh, our rubric for Splash is going to be a callback to one of the most New York moments in the entire movie. Where the... Park Ranger at the Statue of Liberty screams, Bocce Balls! Bocce Balls! So, on a scale of one to five Bocce Balls, what do we give the plot and writing of Splash? I'm going to start with Andy. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a neat idea. I mean, I, I it's a fun idea. But I think there's too many places where it falls apart. Um... So I want to give it a three, but I'm going to go with a two. Mm. I will jump in and say, I agree with you, Andy. I'm going to give it a two. So we'll jump to Robert. I'm going to agree with you as well. I think there's, there's elements there. I liked, Uh, I thought it was entertaining all the way through the second act, even with some of the, the hiccups. And that's going to give me enough to give it a three. All right. And Michael. Yeah, I'm somewhere in between. I mean, the idea I really like, 
and it's a fun sort of high concept idea, but like it's so inconsistent throughout and it goes on oh, just a little too long and I'm gonna, uh, I'll go with, uh, I'll say a three, I guess. Reluctant three. A reluctant three, yeah, a low three, <laughs> let's say. And next we'll go to casting and acting. And I'll start this. I was going to say a five because you've got, you know, Tom Hanks is, you know, one of the generational talents getting a, a lead role this early in his career is a big deal. Daryl Hannah, obviously wonderful. Um, I, you know, I think that it quite wasn't at a five for me. I think I, I also the New York guys, great casting. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I'll just say a four, r- right beneath a five. Robert, I mean, you, yeah, you you pretty much stole mine verbatim. I was, I I liked candy and elements of it, but um, I thought Hanks was great, Hannah was great, Levy was great, Candy was okay in moments. So it's enough for a four for me, but not quite a five. And Michael. Yeah, I agree with everybody. I think Tom Hanks and Daryl Hannah were great. Daryl Hannah really does a lot with what could be like a thankless role. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she could coast on just being like super pretty, but like there's like sort of a sadness and pathos and whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I think she does a good job. Eugene Levy, I don't think like it isn't written to his like, like I love Eugene Levy, but they just don't like give him enough to do except get like beat up a lot which right. is it's like they waste him and man ever since you said uh michael keaton could have been freddie mm. that's all i could think about yeah. that would have been oh that would have been so i i, I think he would have fit that so much better so yeah. anyway I'm, I'm going with a four two because the two leads are great and i think levy was underserved but yeah andy yeah i I agree with you guys. I think Tom Hanks did an, a great job. I think Daryl Hannah did a great job. I mean, she's just like, what, like a year after this is like a year after Blade Runner. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought she did great. And I love John Candy and I love Eugene Levy. And there are parts in this movie where I was genuinely entertained by them. Um, but I still, I think they were either, they played it too broad, too big. Um, so that, that kind of brings it down a little bit. So I'm going to stay, I'm going to go with a four. All right, Andy, we'll go back to you, right? For production value. What do you think? I mean, really, what, what they, the fact that they had the some of the underwater stuff was fantastic. I know we, we've already talked about that, and we've talked about how cool those shots were. Uh, I think so what brings that down a little bit is the fact that they, you know, they're include places of the you know, Caribbean places with makes it supposed to be Cape Cod. Um, I, I, again, I, I liked the effect of the, the tail. I thought that was pretty cool. I thought they did a good job there. I, uh, and other than that though, it's a lot of just on location, on location kind of thing. So I'm just going to go with the middle of the road kind of a thing. I think we go with a three. Okay. And Robert. Uh, yeah, I will echo what Andy said. I think the underwater stuff was great. Uh, the special effects with the fish tail, uh, was really good and i think that's going to be enough to push it up to a four for me uh especially for the underwater shots and i remember i'll I'll sidebar here for a little bit that uh tom hanks talking about shooting the underwater scenes with with ron howard and they had these like plastic domes that they had way down you know 20 30 feet down that they could go into to talk to each other so they'd have to go all the way to the surface to talk and he Hmm. said it was it was it was kind of really tough to shoot that stuff because of that because not trying to communicate underwater and um but they had these little domes all the way all all around that they could all all the actors could could get up underneath and uh and you know poke their head out of the water so they could talk um and that story i mean it makes you know i I found that kind of fascinating so that's for me that's it's going to push up to a four okay and michael yeah i'm between a three and a four but i think like all the underwater stuff gets it a four for me and i'll agree with that i thought uh, uh you know we've said 
amazing music, but I, I do think the music could have been better. Um, yeah, it was very of its time. That's going to knock it down. But I, I thought the underwater stuff was really cool. And uh, yeah, so you forth. think they just didn't have the budget? I mean, all they had they had enough it has to get Wooly to be Bully, something. and that was yeah. It. I don't know, but it wasn't even the original. So like, right? Was that did they pay less for that? I don't know. It felt yeah like that was the missing link. Overall entertainment value. We're going to go with Michael. I'm going to go straight down the middle of the road. Three, three here. Could have, could have done more with its premise, but it was kind of just like all over the place. Uh, I will agree with that. I'll say three. It was neither here nor there for me. Uh, Andy. Same. I agree with the three. Uh, it, it did make me, it made me wonder that if this was a early preview for, um, Levy and Candy, when they teamed up again two years later and did uh, Armed and Dangerous, oh, yeah. they, they played the same kind of style, same kind of characters in that one as a sense. So, uh, but yeah, it, it was a three. And we'll end with Robert. What do you, what do you give it? How many bocce well, balls? Like I mentioned earlier, I watched this a lot as a kid, um, despite some of the adult theming that I wasn't really catching at the time. Um, but I hadn't watched it since I was maybe like 12 up until this this year. And that's a pretty good indication that I liked it then, but I haven't really wanted to go back to it since. So, I mean, as you all said, it it, it kind of missed the mark at times. So uh, I'm going to go with a three as well. I thought everything that it did well, uh, Short Circuit and Crocodile Dundee 2 did better. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about Short Circuit when she was talking in uh, her commercial talk. I thought of Max from uh, Fly the Navigator <laughs> and Johnny Five uh, when oh, she was doing her commercial talk. So, yeah. It's definitely of a time. That's for sure. All right. So, let's put this into our computer that wore tennis shoes and see what it says. Robert, what does the computer that wore tennis shoes say? The computer that wore tennis shoes has tallied the bocce balls, and we are coming in at a 3.31, which is going okay. to place it at number seven overall right out of 12. Edging out Freaky Friday. Hey, hey. I'm always no. happy to see that one go down. And coming in just below Great Mouse Detective. Well, now we have ranked it. And, uh, Mike, what did Leonard Malton have to say about this film? Leonard Malton says, I'm in love with a mermaid. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Lenny. That's what he said. He thought it was uh, a little overlong, but he was a fan. He's in love with that mermaid. Man. That's what Leonard Malton said. Well, do you know that there was another mermaid movie, like, in production at the same time? That was like something yeah, with Warren Beatty. Yeah. I was oh. reading about that. Yeah. Yeah. Th- they were uh, apparently Grazer and Ron Howard sold Disney on it, said they could make this like cheaper and faster than the other one. And then the other one just never got made. So Boom. missed out on that Warren Beatty mermaid action. Tom Hanks took his candy. I wonder if that explains any of the shortcomings of the movie. If they were. Just yeah, that's a good point. I was just thinking that. Um, uh they had to rush it that's an interesting point i don't know hmm. apparently there's a big documentary on like the 20th anniversary dvd or something like that so hmm. we can check it out get the inside scoop can't wait <laughs> anything else about splash gentlemen i'm in love with the mermaid <laughs> <laughs> nailed it no i just wish i could um Go hang out at Madison's Dive right now. Oh, I do too. In, uh, down at Disney Springs. It'd be great. Yeah. I had no idea that the fountain was uh, sitting there at uh, the old Hollywood Studios. You walked and by it so many times. Know, well, maybe not. It was out of the, yeah. It's underneath the Star War now. That's right. <laughs> maybe they just ground it up and made it into some rocks for Star War. So it's interesting that Ron Howard went from this to Cocoon. Yeah. That's interesting. Just, he had to use that Gutenberg. He found Gutenberg, and he knew he knew he needed to use him in something. Yeah, he's like that Gutenberg. He's got it. I wonder how closely they, the it. shooting schedules were aligned with those, because uh, they shot heavily down in the you know off the coast of Florida and the for Cocoon and uh, 
and for this movie, or well, not heavily, but you know, it's, it's through all the underwater stuff. Yeah, so. I don't know. He was just trying to schedule his vacations, I guess. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> well, we've made it into Touchstone. We've done the Touchstone episode, so I mean, I can't wait to see what happens next. There's a lot of great, terrible Touchstone movies we could really go into. Yeah, so. there's there's a lot, a lot that I haven't seen, even despite them being very prominent at the time. That's right. The down and out in Beverly Hills of it all. So now your requests, you listener, can include these Touchstone films. Please include them in your requests. Uh, you know, right now. Robert is sifting through the libraries at Disney Plus, putting together season three. It's very hard to believe um, that we're, you know, making our way through season two. He's already doing season three, so please uh, keep sending your suggestions on our social media. It's at we're going to use some film. of them. That's right. That's right. Yep, I already got I got two already in the list. I believe. There you go. Uh, what you know, our our Halloween special. That was another one. And if you haven't listened to that, you know, maybe you're still in the Halloween spirit. Check it out, Mr. Boogity. And we have another holiday special coming up soon. Robert, what can you tell us about that? We are going to a place I've never been before. And that's partly because I've been told not to go there. Branson, <laughs> Missouri. <laughs> but we've completed the trials of our pilot episode. We've navigated the waters of season one. And we have explored the vastness of Pandora. And we have emerged ready to tackle a true holiday classic. We, the society, will be watching Babes in Toyland. I have absolutely no idea what is in store. Other than the warnings that I've gotten, so maybe I do know what's in store. But <laughs> either way, we are going there. It's going to get trippy, man. Trippy Christmas. Uh, it's going to get something. Yeah, sorry. So stay tuned for that this month. And that's going to wrap up the year for us, but uh, we're not we're not stopping. Robert, what's coming in the new year? So in 2021, which is really it's hard Man. to believe that we're we're it's coming coming fast. That's weird. We are kicking the new year off with one of my all time favorite movies. If I had to point to a movie of my childhood. This one would be near the top, and it's still in the top today. I still watch it. We are traveling to the West Indies and living in the trees with the Swiss family Robinson. I really look Ooh. forward to seeing yeah. what we have to say about that. I've been watching this a lot with my kids lately, and uh, I've been marveling at the set design, and I really, really can't wait. This has been on my radar since I cooked up this idea, so... This is going to be, it's gonna be exciting. Going to be exciting. I believe it's our first with Moochie, so that's exciting. The Moochie verse is going to be opened. Open the Moochie verse. Yes. <laughs> uh, speaking of set design, how about some design work for your brand? I bet you need some. Don't make the mistake of coming up with some great idea and then falling flat by phoning in all the graphic design elements you need to bring your idea to life. Get an experienced design artist. Get Todd Naperick. Bindinggraphics.com. You know what he's good at? Making you look good. Todd makes you look good. So, stay tuned for one more episode this month. We will be having a Christmas time with Babes in Toyland. And we look forward to hearing from you. Please be in touch. Info at medfieldfilm.com. At medfieldfilm on social media. Look forward to joining you later this month. From all of us to all of you. Wish you well. So long. How are we a mighty red field? How my mother dear? All your sons and daughters hail to be Red field college of technology. And while we hold your banner high, rock, rock, we shout your praises to the sky, rock, rock, for proud are we a mighty red